What we recently recognized, we as gender studies scholars, is that our work suddenly became very important. So previously, gender studies uh, uh, scholars uh, have been working in uh, cellars or in ethics and, you know, some very uh, determined uh, faculty members and uh, some very nice students, but suddenly our work became really important. And then we were wondering why. And of course, you know, it's a hubris to believe that, you know, our work is so important, but unfortunately it turned out that gender became a symbolic glue in all these um, uh, recent uh, debates which are happening now. So uh, with Veronika Grzebelska and Esther Kovács, we developed this concept of gender as symbolic glue. And if we understand this concept, then we will understand why uh, certain political forces, intellectuals, politicians are actually attacking what they think gender is. And I also think this is a productive way of approaching it because it is a kind of not reactive approach. So it also opens up possibility for um, innovative and creative thinking and not only a kind of defensive uh, self-pity, which is often the case. So why gender became so important is that gender actually glues together different uh, ideas, different actors and uh, different aspirations. So gender became a, a symbolic glue because it um, uh, creates uh, unexpected alliances. So if you look at the uh, Russian Orthodox Church and the Polish Catholic Church, you cannot imagine two entities uh, farther away than these two entities. And still, if you look at gender and gender politics, you know, they are very much similar. And uh, this uh, is also a good political uh, tool to create alliances. So that's why, you know, this is the first reason gender became a symbolic glue, because politically uh, it's a very good uh, 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 tool. The second reason why gender became a, uh, a symbolic glue is that it operates via a very different language. And it's full of emotions and uh, it actually operates via hate and fear and creates enemies. And uh, like the LGBTQIT people, the migrants, George Soros, or the gender studies professionals themselves. And very often um, uh, analysts and academics are uh, mistaken uh, looking at the targets instead of why this um, uh, certain groups and individuals are becoming the target. And this uh, kind of language is a very powerful language, which uh, uh, it turned out was impossible possible to eliminate from the European and global political vocabulary, although there were several uh, attempts and tendencies um, to do that. And also gender became a symbolic glue because um, this uh, uh, concept actually uh, created a space to exercise criticism towards the existing neoliberal uh, world order and to create uh, what they think is a livable, viable, desirable alternative to our present uh, neoliberal world order, which is of course full of uh, uh, problems. And uh, this kind of situation is fundamentally new. And uh, we are arguing in this article that it's not a backlash. So our word will never be something we used to have before. And also this nostalgia to the lost word before the gender wars uh, is extremely harmful and uh, politically short-sighted. And therefore this kind of approach is um, uh, really helping us to understand that uh, we are in a new phase. And this new phase is uh, uh, working via the concept of gender and the earlier we recognize, the better we are able to construct um, uh, reactive positive strategies.
Gender became this symbolic glue. It means that uh, it became uh, a center for this political uh, discussion and it um, created a space and also offered instruments to create a viable, livable, desirable alternative to the present neoliberal world order. So uh, I'm sorry to say gender is really not important. And it's also a mistake if uh, academics and scholars and activists are actually focusing on gender. Gender is just uh, one of the spaces where this uh, socializational uh, war, this Kulturkampf is actually being fought. And it's also a mistake to believe that everything is an anti-gender movement. Uh, but uh, you know, several other movements are also instrumentalizing gender as a concept uh, and using it to create enemies because uh, uh, gender is um, uh, is a as a glue gluing together different actors, aspirations, and uh, institutions which are acting together in order to create a new world order. And uh, this kind of uh, socializational fight is always happening when the left is weak and the progressive politics is weak. So just following Walter Benjamin's uh, criticism and analysis of the, of the Weimar Republic, I think this is the right moment to ask uh, self-critical questions uh, about what did we do wrong and what went wrong uh, and where did we miss the point to create a, uh, an attractive and uh, desirable future and a vision for the future. The attack on, on gender studies in the different countries manifests in a different ways. So if you look at Brazil, where some of the professionals are actually killed, or if you look at Turkey, when professionals are put into jail, uh, it's a very different situation than in Hungary, when suddenly the government issued a decree uh, deleting uh, a two-year master's program in gender studies from the accredited um, study lists. So on the one hand, you think uh, they are all very different. On the other hand, there is one common root of all these uh, attacks, which might manifest differently in the different national context. It might, uh, the, say, the root is uh, the attack on academia and uh, academic freedom and what we know science as such. So that's why the attacks on gender studies uh, should matter not only to gender studies professionals, but everybody who is interested in science, what we consider science after the Enlightenment, and also academic freedom. Because these attacks, on the one hand, uh, attacking uh, kind of dedicated but small group of people uh, and uh, that's the reason uh, of this attack because those forces who are attacking gender studies they are just testing the solidarity in academia and that's why it was so important when the, uh, the two-year master's program in gender studies in Hungary was deleted from the study list that there was a word wide protest. So from the rector's conference in Belgium to the different professional organizations, they were actually supporting uh, our uh, department, the gender studies department at Central European University. So uh, I was receiving uh, this, all these letters from uh, very dear colleagues all over in different professions and also institutions and also media outlets were actually showing interest. And uh, I consider it as, a, as an opportunity. So, you know, once uh, I told it to a BBC journalist that I'm extremely grateful to uh, Prime Minister Orban and his cabinet because if they hadn't had attacked gender studies, uh, BBC, the New York Times and uh, uh, the Liberation, they would not have been interested in my work on memory of the Second World War and gendering the sexual violence during the Second World War. So this is a general attack on academia and academia as such as a part of uh, the socializational fight. So here we have to really clearly differentiate between the actors, the targets and the principles. So therefore it's uh, really uh, crucial to understand that those actors who are attacking gender studies with very different arguments, uh, they are having in mind a different science. So, for example, when they were attacking a gender studies program in, in Hungary with the argument that it uh, 
uh, there is no interest for it, which of course was a lie, or uh, our students cannot get any kind of good employment, which of course was false. Uh, when they were saying that they don't want to invest uh, uh, stack taxpayers' money in it, which was a lie, because CEU is a private university, so not a penny from a, um, a taxpayer's budget is going in there. When they were saying that it's against Christianity, then uh, these are you know, all those uh, uh, arguments which are actually covering the real thing. And that's why for uh, gender studies professionals and also those intellectuals who are deeply concerned about the developments, they have to take one step back and ask the question, why are these people constantly and consciously saying, uh, making arguments which they know it's not true? And these people are not stupid. I mean, in the case of Hungary, uh, half of the government had been um, uh, uh, supported by uh, the Open Society Foundation, the George Soros uh, founded institution, or they were graduates of Central European University. So are, they are not stupid. So they have an agenda. So the question, what is this agenda? And this agenda is connected to a very different vision of science, and this vision they have is uh, connected to replacing the previous elite to create this uh, uh, polypore state, what we call with Veronika Grzebalska the polypore state. So my main argument is that all these attacks are connected to building up to a new state, and this new state operates uh, replace with replacing the uh, non-loyal actors. So this polypore state, this polypore is this um, mushroom which lives on the trunk of the tree, is uh, sucking the energy, the ideas, the values from the tree and produces nothing else than this polypore, this mushroom. This is a parasite. And these uh, parallel institutions, uh, uh, universities, research institutes, uh, uh, what they are actually setting up parallel to the already existing accredited and formerly existing research institutes based on the only criteria, which is loyalty to the government. So uh, when you look at this attack on gender studies, you have to think about the agenda. The agenda is to eliminate the independent, critical uh, uh, research and academic uh, inquiry, replacing it with polypore institutions. So uh, that will be actually a great test for the European and global academic community to see how they are actually cooperating with these polypore institutions and the polypore researchers who are actually doing their jobs because the real academics and those who actually uh, dare to ask real questions were actually marginalized and sometimes put into prison. When you have the attacks on gender studies, the first uh, task is to recognize what is happening. And that's where the problem starts, because the vocabulary, the concepts, the ideas we have, they are not matching this very particular new reality we are living in. So the first task is to try to find a kind of heuristic tool to explain what is happening. And because we fail to have those analytical tools, very often the reaction is uh, sinking into the level of uh, um, kind of uh, uh, uncritical panic, or self-pity, or blaming the others, or uh, uh, simply using uh, violent communication, instead of understanding what is really happening. And of course, I don't want to pretend that I know what is happening, but with several colleagues, we have been thinking about these developments in the past 10 years. So this is not a new development. It has been going on for quite a while. And uh, uh, what we also uh, did in this project, and if you look at the, the book uh, Gender as Symbolic Glue, which was published by the Foundation of European Progressive Studies and it's online available, then you see that we compared five countries and the reactions, uh, how the, uh, the civil society, the women's movement, academics and politicians reacted to this kind of attack, which I would like to stress again, this is not about gender studies. This is not about um, uh, gender roles, this is not about sexuality, but this is about a bigger 
fight for uh, uh, domination and a bigger fight about uh, socialization. So this is about a, a fight between two very different worldviews. So when we analyze the reactions in Slovakia, in Germany, in Hungary, in Poland, uh, and in France, what we found that depending on the different national context, the reactions were very different and brought very different results. Let me give you one example, which is Slovakia. When the women's movement and the feminist activists and the um, uh, academics were simply not reacting in a sense that they decided not to get into media debates, not to publish, not to react to this kind of uh, debates. And somehow, you know, this whole thing was basically dying out in Slovakia uh, because uh, this discussion is actually fueling the thing. Right? So that, again, please think about the polypore. This is like a vampire, which is sucking the energy. It doesn't have its own circulation or all ideas, but sucking the energy and using the energy from, of the others to maintain itself. And if the other is simply saying, no, I'm not participating in it, I'm not participating in your game, I have my own game, then this whole attempt is basically doomed. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at Poland, for example, it uh, resulted in a very deep division inside the feminist and gender studies community because somehow they interiorized this kind of us and them and who is allying with whom kind of discussion and that uh, brought you know, very mixed results. On the other hand, the other consequence is that there are um, some scholars who believe that only academia and uh, the ivory tower of academia can save us. And uh, they are basically ignoring any kind of outreach or public activism, consciously saying that gender studies is the same science as brain surgery or whatever. And that's also, you know, something which uh, some colleagues are questioning because they are, they believe that uh, uh, gender studies had been always uh, developed uh, with very close ties with activism and also with critical thinking. And uh, uh, this kind of reaction is also questionable in the long run, I believe. Uh, also, there are several personal strategies. So some colleagues who had been uh, working in gender studies and traveling in gender studies conferences, suddenly they decide that now they are working on family studies because recently family studies is the buzzword of conservative and the liberal governments, which is getting lots of funding. And, uh, you know, you cannot really blame individually the academics who are like the sunflower, you know, turning towards the sun, which is the funding, uh, because they also have to pay the gas bill. So there are lots of different important ethical, professional, intellectual, emotional questions which needs to be uh, 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 responded to in this particular interesting historical moment. And, uh, you know, this it's very difficult when the history is knocking on your door and you have to answer. And the question is, what will be your answer? And this is a personal you know, response and it a lot depends on the, uh, on the personal abilities and, uh, and uh, skills and, uh, and courage. And also it's a structural problem. And let me finish by this, uh, cultural, uh, this uh, structural issue that um, for the uh, long run, what will be really crucial that how these institutions, which are set up by the illiberal states and which are funded partly uh, on the expense of the previously existing critical scientific institutions, how these institutions will be incorporated and, uh, and uh, be a part of the European uh, intellectual and academic scene. Because on the one hand, there is an argument saying that, you know, boycott or uh, cordon sanitaire, they don't really work in the long run. On the other hand, uh, there should be some mechanisms which are actually uh, drawing a line and also because these institutions uh, are not hiring people based on competitive excellence but based on loyalty and personal ties. So basically this new science which is developing 
in front of our eyes now is going back to the Middle Ages when these different church uh, 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 schools were selecting people depending on the feudal ties. And the loyalty uh, demonstrated in this process was the main criterion. So if uh, we believe in excellence and the competitiveness of the European um, uh, kind of research area, this is a question we really have to ask uh, seriously, that what are the, uh, the criterion based on which certain academic cooperation had been uh, planned and developed.